Vance says they have to be able to jump within 12 hours. The Nautilus leaves and comes back and then within Nautilus 12 hours because Discovery back. has not left. Nautilus went but it from took weeks the Orion for salvage the Nautilus to get to, to, no, to Federation, Federation HQ in weeks. From he took long Captain enough driver plan. Booker had to because make a pre recorded message. Because the message refit for Discovery down. took weeks. And so then Nautilus the went from the Orion book back because they went from the Federation to jump HQ when to the book Orion was be just so about to be sent the Nautilus leaves to another camp and comes for more back for like two weeks and they got it within like 40 minutes. They managed to but do it, which is extremely lucky. For and then they get on the Nautilus. Alas, we cannot have those days back. We must look forward to the future where nothing makes sense and the cells are detached. Remember how I said that if we had more Michael congratulations in the next episode, I would have to give it a measured decrease in value proportional to the amount of congratulation for Michael. Well, I'm holding myself to that, and you're going to find out how that affects the score at the end. Um, this is Scavengers, which is the sixth episode of season three of spaceship discovery and um are we over halfway through like is that uh is this a 10 episode season i hope not because that means we got four left and we don't have it doesn't look like the plot is converging yet because these shows have like an overarching movie style plot that I don't I don't like very much but uh, that's beside the point um, mainly uh, how are we going to tie the entire plot together in four episodes in a satisfying way that is not absolutely schizophrenic breakneck speed like the past two seasons I don't know but we'll see what happens uh, at the beginning of this episode, we find that the Discovery is being refit, and uh, I don't know about you, but I have never ever seen a ship get an A designation for just a simple refit. Like, what? Wh why do they need the A? Why does this need to be a different ship? It's clearly not. It's still the Discovery. That's not what the letter designation is for. Previously, that was reserved for the Enterprise, but... You know, if you believe um, on-screen canon, there's a few points in TNG where you can see other ships uh, listed in uh, uh, reams of data on screen where you can see that they have letter designation now. Is that canon? I don't know. Just because we see it, if you believe the screen canon theory, then yes, but I don't put 100% faith in screen canon because that would mean that a wrench lying on a desk that's clearly from the 20 or 21st century is canon. I don't know. Some weird things have happened before that can't be canon. Even though it happened on screen. So. Anyway, Discovery now has A. Instead of just being called Discovery. When it's the same ship. And wasn't completely totaled, I don't think. Uh, and now it has horrific detached nacelles. And, again, with the cutouts, again, with the negative space in the ship design, why do they like this so much? After uh, 2017, when we went into Kurtzman Trek, uh, all the ships have to have cutouts. Like, they have to have holes in them. Why is this? Um, it's, I mean, it's kind of cool. If you're talking about the far-flung future... Like, it kind of makes sense for the ships in the 32nd century or whatever we're in. But, um, I just, I don't know why we have to see it on every ship. Even the Cerritos in Lower Decks has it. And, uh, I thought that was kind of stupid. I was hoping when, uh, it went into, for like a, a repair at the end of Lower Decks, they would get rid of that. But they probably didn't. Um, that's beyond the scope of this review, however. Um... The, the interface on 
the discovery is also changed with this refit. You have programmable matter interfaces that interact with your hands for, I don't know, seemingly no reason. And they have a little hologram that juts out and they're holding it, and I'm just thinking, like, why? Like, why does why is holographic technology went down the shitter so much since uh, the 24th century? Like, they had perfectly look good looking, real looking, indistinguishable from real life holograms. And why are we going back to this hologram so that you can kind of see through? Why are we doing that? Right? Like, on my DeviantArt, I had designed a bridge for the Enterprise H that had models of things above the panels floating there that you could physically grab and were 100% accurate to real life. And you could hold them and take them away and do something with them. And they were hard and you couldn't see through them. That was possible hundreds of years before this. Um, if you follow Trek technological canon, okay? So from whence comes the ugly holograms? I don't know. And when they got the badges, they got their new badges on, right? And they press it and go boop. And this huge, annoying holographic display appears in front of them. And it's just awful. Just hate it. Why is it? Why can you see through it? It just makes it hard to use. It should have been, they press their badge, and a panel appears, not like this, but like this, and lower, and it's physically real, and it's floating there, and they can touch it, and it has, it has tactile feedback to when they touch it. That would be cool, and it would be interesting, and look different, and really cement an interesting idea in the viewer's mind instead of this crap that we have that looks like every other show. Anyway, getting back on topic. Um, the Discovery uh, basically is stationed inside Federation headquarters and is now a part of Starfleet again, thank God. And Siru was in a briefing with all the other captains. And... They mentioned that these other captains have their own missions, and I was getting excited for a minute, because I thought we were going to get a good mission. But no, Michael decides that she has to go out on her own, and uh, she has to, like, ignore a direct order from Seru and from Vance to stay in Federation headquarters and don't leave, because they need the Discovery ready to jump. Uh, they need Discovery to be their fast response ship, okay? Kind of like how it was in Season 1. But the Nautilus, which is Book's ship, um, returns to Federation HQ on autopilot. And there's an automated message inside it that basically says that if I didn't make it on the secret mission, Nautilus will go to Federation HQ and inform them that I need help. And also I have a black box, which is from inside um one of these uh, starships that was involved in the burn, and Michael wants this because she wants to discover the origin and cause of the burn. So Michael wants this black box. Previously, like on our ships, we would call that a recorder, but black box it is then. Uh, so Michael's like, oh, I want to go get that black box, but the mission is not sanctioned by Starfleet, and yet I wear the badge, and oh my god... If I wear this badge, do I have to listen to Vance? Yes, I do. But they decide not to for some reason. And Georgie was like, Hmm, you had me at unsanctioned mission. I'll do it because it's unsanctioned and I'm evil. So they go to where the origin of the signal was that they got on the Nautilus, which is basically where Book is. And it's an Orion-run um, salvage operation run, run by slaves. Orion slavers. Um, what else is new? Uh, isn't that kind of weird that in all this time, a thousand years, we still have Orion slavers? Like, couldn't we come up with something else? Like, wouldn't it be cool if the Orions were, like, not like that anymore? That would be neat. Like, imagine if it was something you didn't expect. Like, it was, like, some new alien race, or it was, like, uh, Bajoran uh, slavers, you know, like just something 
something you you wouldn't be able to predict, right? Wouldn't that be cool? Um, but no, we have Orions again. Womp womp. So they get into this uh, slave operation where they're buying products that are, came from the salvage, the orbital salvage, which looks like it included a few Starfleet ships. I think I saw one that looked like the Hiawatha that you might remember from the beginning of Season 2, um, but I'm not sure. The configuration says Hiawatha to me, but um, they basically find Book, and they make up a whole bunch of malarkey about how, oh, we're here to buy shit, and Georgiou is just strutting her stuff and acting increasingly insane, and somehow she gets away with it. Georgiou is getting really hard for me to believe in this. I'm just thinking, like, to myself, like, the only reason Georgiou gets away with this crap is because everyone else is so stupid. Like, how stupid is everybody in the 32nd century where they don't just immediately shoot Georgiou in the head, bam, for pulling any of that stupid shit that she's been doing? Uh, regardless, um, they find Book, uh, and basically they, they devise a, a plan to instigate a riot in the slave camp, and uh, they steal the, a little device that controls the um, perimeter that kills anybody if they try to leave, and they time it so that it, all the slaves get out, they open the perimeter, the force field, and meanwhile, Georgiou and Michael uh, get on the Nautilus, and they fly it sideways through these two buildings in the camp and shoot all the, the slavers and whatnot, and uh, they escape on a transport ship and on the Nautilus. Uh, with an injured Andorian in tow, and Book. And they've gotten their black box, but Georgiou, being a homicidal maniac, decides to shoot down some of the, um, some of the, uh, floating salvage ships, making them crash onto the camp, probably killing thousands of innocent people. I'm assuming not every slave got out, and she's not reprimanded for this. Michael comes up to her and consoles her and says, Hey, I know you're having a problem with your PTSD, but listen, there's lots of people that can help you. You're not alone. George, you belongs in the brig. She belongs in front of a court. Okay? She's a homicidal maniac murderer who ate Kelpians. Okay? Who's not from our universe? Like, why would you put one ounce of trust in this person? Well, I guess this is Discovery, and, and Sarah would put one ounce of trust in Michael, so I guess it's not surprising that people just trust whoever they want, based totally on feeling. So, they get back to Federation HQ, and my favorite scene in the entire episode is Vance is dressing down Michael, and... Vance, his acting is fantastic because you can see how angry he is. And he's talking without moving his teeth like this. So he's really mad and he's fighting back a scream. And, uh, anyway, the meme is so supreme we have to fight back a scream. Because at some point, Vance says, a hot second. And I was like, wow, dude, you're a time traveler too? I didn't know you were from the 21st century. <laughs> wow, I couldn't have guessed that. Anyway, this whole series is full of 21st century speak that does not, does not belong in the future. But you can chalk that one up to the writers. Um, Vance cannot be the one to reprimand Michael, because Michael is a perfect angel who cannot be defeated by anyone. So instead, Vance tells her, what do you think I would say to you if I were to reprimand you? And Michael says, oh, I did all this bad stuff, and I know you guys have your hands full trying to deal with everything and you don't have time to look after what happened to the burn and blah 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 and it's all very pathetic and then Seru uh, it looks like he's about to cry but he busts Michael back down to chief science officer oh no you you frigging disobeyed a direct order stole the Nautilus went to an Orion slave camp 
with a homicidal maniac from their mirror universe on a whim while you left your ship with Odit's first officer when it needed to be able to jump into action at any moment. And you did that. And you're busted back down to one of the top positions. Basically, chief science officer. Come on. Come on. Buster down to Ensign. That'd be good for her. Speaking of Ensigns, Tilly is an Ensign, and she's walking around giving orders in this episode. And Ciro comes to her for to look for confidence. And I got this sinking feeling that Tilly is going to be the first officer now. I pray to God that she's not, because you can't have an Ensign just be first officer like that. Like, it's, it's a little weird. And then I guess I thought about it. And I couldn't figure out anyone else who could be first officer. Do you guys know? Who else could be first officer but Michael? I mean, nobody wants Michael, but who could who could do it? Uh not Stamets. I mean everyone else is kinda occupied. Basically at the very end of this episode, we see Michael take off her badge. She goes, and she takes off her badge, and that signifies to me that maybe, just maybe, Michael is leaving Starfleet. But when I first watched it, I interpreted it as she's taking that badge off, and she's putting on maybe a science badge, like maybe the badges are different. But, I don't know, but I got this distinct feeling that they ended the episode on that because they wanted her to leave Starfleet and she wants to strike out on her own with Book, which is stupid. I wanted Book in the crew and I wanted the Andorian in the crew. And I wanted Tyler. I, I kind of grew to like Tyler at the end of season one. But, alas, we cannot have those days back. We must look forward to the future. Where nothing makes sense. And nacelles are detached. Um, so yeah. Let's check out some of my honorable mentions. Is the Discovery crew going to get the new uniforms to go along with the refit? I hope so. I kind of like the new uniforms. They're gray and understated. And they remind me of the uniforms from the motion picture. And I'm a big proponent of the motion picture. It's my favorite Star Trek film. The scene of the salvage operation uh, on the surface of the planet that Georgiou and Michael go to looks really fake. Like, it looks like any kind of construction site that I've seen in my entire life. It looks like a mine. Like, it looks like places I've been to. I'm getting uh, Star Trek 2009 vibes from it. Like, when they go to engineering in 2009 film. And it's just like some brewery. Yeah, I'm getting that sensation here big suck. They take advantage of the salvage site to get across some interesting little visual references. You know, as you do. Um, they name drop self-sealing self -sealing stem bolts, which is an interesting nod to Deep Space Nine because they were mentioned a thousand times in passing in Deep Space Nine. I'm pretty sure we saw a TNG phaser and uh, we see a, a bin of old badges and you can see like a Klingon one in there. Pretty cool. The salvage operation is run by a character named Osira, who we do not see. Which means she could be the main bad guy for this season. Or just a one-off. Like the last two villains. I hope she's a cool alien. But probably not. A lot of the character development between Michael and Saru has been dashed in this episode. As said by Saru himself. At one point he mentions that he now distrusts Michael to a degree that he hasn't since they were on the Shenzhou. So, really, these characters are back to square one. Which I guess is an interesting subversion of what you'd expect to happen. So, Michael and Sarah are now at odds with each other again. Which is kind of cool. Uh, because I kind of liked season one. It sounds insane, but season one is looking pretty good now. It's looking sensible now by comparison, which is sad. When they get to the slave encampment, 
book seems awful tripper for someone who's enslaved. He didn't seem defeated or beaten down a lot. I don't know if it was because he was a recent arrival, but... If I were Book, I think I'd be a little bit more distraught. So far, most of the bad guys in this season are using the same type of gun. It's like some type of hand cannon thing that covers your entire hand and you shoot it like this. I think it actually looks pretty stupid and it looks like a toy. I don't want to see them anymore. In the B plot for this episode that takes place, I guess, on the Discovery, we basically just have a meeting between Adira and Paul. And they kind of hit it off because Adira is this 16-year-old genius, surprise, surprise. And she is she loves someone who has recently died, but yet is somehow back to life and lives on in, inside her, inside her symbiont. And Paul has experienced the same thing with Hugh. Hugh has died and has come back to life. And so they have something in common. And it's really rare for these people to find each other because it's not often to be in love with someone who dies and then actually comes back. So, understandably, they kind of hit it off. But, um, one thing that was strange was that uh, Adira made modifications to the spore drive and how it operated without anyone knowing, without Paul knowing, and while the ship needed to be able to jump at a moment's notice. Doesn't that seem a little strange to you? And as far as I know, she's not in Starfleet. I didn't see a badge on her. So, why are we allowing Adira to do that? And then Adira also removes the splint things in Paul's arms, right? Which you'd think should be removed by Hugh, the chief medical officer, who is Paul's boyfriend, by the way. And he, who doesn't know? He, he didn't know that, that Paul had these removed. By Adira, who was just a kid and not in Starfleet. So, I think we got a Wesley on our hands. One of the running gags in this episode is that Linus, who I think is a Saurian, um, cannot adjust to the new sight to sight beaming with his badge. The new badges, you press them twice and you can beam wherever you want to, which I guess it reads your mind, maybe. But uh, Linus can't get this to work and he keeps beaming into the wrong spot. So, we have a scene. And it's going on without a hitch. And then Linus beams into the scene. Whoops, this isn't this isn't medical. I'm sorry. And he, he keeps going. And I just keep wondering if one of these times he's going to accidentally beam himself into space. I wonder, do the badge have some kind of safety for that so you cannot beam yourself into space? Um, probably. Anyway, the entire episode is uh, playing off this idea that um, Michael is pretending that she doesn't love book and no one believes it and we got the will they won't they type thing and then at the end they finally are in a turbo lift and somehow book knows the exact button to press to stop the turbo lift right it hasn't been updated with uh, a vocal interface he actually thought to press this one button to make it stop and book knows the exact button which is kind of funny but uh they stop the turbo lift and then they kiss and Actually, right before they kiss, Linus beams into the scene. He's like, boop, boop, whoops, this isn't where I wanted to go, and then beams away. And you think the kiss is going to stop there, but actually it's a double fake out, because then after that, their first kiss gets interrupted. Linus beams in, he beams out, and then they finish the kiss, which is interesting, because a lot of shows, they uh, play up, they, they add, they build tension by making it so this kiss doesn't happen because of an interruption. But in this episode, they decided to make the kiss happen. So it's a double fake out. When Seru consoles in Tilly and asks Tilly for help with what to do with Admiral Vance and what to do with the disappearance of Michael, Tilly says, Michael is one of the people I love most in this world. Really? Why is... I don't understand. Why does everyone love her? I can't think of anyone who would be really, really close to Michael. Can you? I just, I just can't see it. Like, I don't... This... I think it's probably because... The writers assume that there's things happening off-screen that we don't see. Um, 
normally what you would do is show characters who like each other wasting time with each other, like just spending time with each other just to be with each other. And uh, we don't really see that in Discovery because it's so overly concerned with getting across its plot. Uh, the show is written as though it feels like it's running out of time. So we don't have the small moments between characters. So therefore, characters don't really feel like friends with each other. Um, the characters who seem like they could maybe be friends would maybe be Paul and Reno. But that's it. Uh, and that's just really me grasping for it. Like, that's real when I really have to think about it to see that. Like, it, it doesn't really jump out as obvious, right? So, yeah. Kind of shitty. So, basically, I wanted to give this episode a 6.5, but the Michael congratulation busted it down to a 6 out of 10. Much like how Michael was busted down as chief science officer. The episode ended up better than the preview made it look. This is the first episode where I found Georgie to be interesting, given her PTSD. Adira and Paul make a natural team. And is Sarah considering Tilly for first officer? I certainly hope not. I was hoping Booker joined the crew, and also that Andorian. Vance was excellent in this episode. Michael got some deserved comeuppance. But what does the overall thematic core of this episode contain? Nothing really. Six, six out of ten. I wanted to do 6.5. Too much Michael congratulation. Six out of ten. And that's just based on my feelings, okay? That's not based on logic. So, this episode is a six out of ten as soon as you come out of it. But God forbid you think about it. If you think about this episode, it gets worse. It's one of those. This is a turn your brain off episode, unfortunately, which is sad to say for Star Trek. Because if you think about uh, time constraints involved and the vastness of space, it doesn't make sense that the Nautilus took weeks to get to Federation HQ. And then Nautilus got back... Nautilus went from the Orion salvage planet to not to federation in weeks he took it took long enough that booker had to make a pre-recorded message okay and then nautilus went from the orion went from federation hq to the orion salvage planet fast enough that they could get book back they could rescue book when Book was be just about to be sent to another camp for more for like two weeks, and they got it within like forty minutes. They managed to do it, which is extremely lucky. And then they get on the Nautilus and send a message back to Federation HQ where Discovery is, or specifically they send a message to Discovery to have the to have medical ready to receive the Andorian that they have that's injured. So if they could send a message back. That means that either the Orion salvage plant is really close to the Federation HQ, or subspace has, has come back, which I thought subspace relays were destroyed. Um, am I missing something? Was there a scene that was just cut out? Um, just watch this episode and keep a mental note of... The times mentioned, okay? Keep a mental note of time frame. Vance says they have to be able to jump within 12 hours. The Nautilus leaves and comes back within 12 hours because Discovery has not left. But it took weeks for the Nautilus to get to Federation HQ from the slave driver planet because the refit for Discovery took weeks. Am I missing something? Alright, uh, I don't think I showed you guys this, but uh, I recently got uh, about two days leave to uh, return to Earth for Halloween. Uh, we did uh, October 30th and 31st here, and um, I'm going to show you a little bit of my Halloween excursion. And, um, as you can see, 
Uh, there I am with my uniform on, unfortunately. I forgot my, uh, my costume, so that kind of sucks, but as you can see, um, it looks like everybody else is wearing their costume because everyone else, for some reason, has dressed up as a 21st century Earth human. Uh, kind of boring, but uh, what can you do?